become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Hello and welcome to today's virtual program with Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. I'm Fred Blackwell and I'll be moderating today's discussion. I'm the CEO of the San Francisco Foundation, which is dedicated to creating a Bay Area where everyone can find a good job, live in a safe and affordable home and exercise their political voice regardless of their race or zip code. Uh, to donate to the Commonwealth Club and to support programs like this one, please click on the blue donate button at the top of the uh, YouTube or chat box or visit commonwealthclub.org. Uh, there'll be questions and answers and I encourage everybody to uh, submit those and uh, those will be curated and we'll try to uh, get to as many as we can over the course of the program or at the end. But now it is my pleasure uh, to introduce today's program, uh, bolstering the African-American community uh, in San Francisco. Uh, and we have two panelists that I am really uh, excited to engage uh, with today. Uh, Mayor London Bree uh, and President of the Board of Supervisors, uh, Shema Walton. Uh, you know, when I was uh, uh, looking at my calendar on Monday morning uh, and looking at the week, I have to admit uh, that today uh, and this time was really circled for me. I've really, look, really been looking forward uh, to this conversation. And, uh, one of the reasons why is because, you know, I've been able to uh, have a kind of a front row uh, view uh, to uh, a lot of the work that both of you all have been engaged in. And there are a lot of similarities between that work. Both of you all uh, born and raised in San Francisco uh, and so know the community very well. Uh, both have kind of worked and been employees in the bureaucracy uh, of the city and county of San Francisco run nonprofits that have been at times in partnership with the city and other times in an uh, antagonistic relationship uh, with the city. Uh, and now we're kind of two of the uh, most powerful elected leaders in the city. And it's really been uh, a privilege for me to uh, watch all of that. I feel like I've professionally uh, grown up with uh, the both of you. And uh, in the case of uh, Mayor Bree, I uh, had the pleasure of her being my boss. Uh, for almost five years when I was the executive director uh, of the redevelopment uh, agency. But for, I can't think, uh, for both of you all, um, it really feels like uh, the right kind of leadership uh, at the right time. Uh, and, you know, I don't have to tell uh, either one of you all about the fact that, uh, you know, San Francisco has produced uh, amazing uh, business leaders, political leaders, uh, leaders in entertainment, industry, and sports, uh, but also San Francisco has been uh, a place where a lot of uh, African-American folks, frankly, have struggled. Uh, we've been the, on the receiving end of displacement and gentrification. Uh, when you look at the homelessness in, in San Francisco, a lot of the folks that you see uh, are African-American as well. And so uh, it's really this kind of tale of two cities and two experiences uh, for African-Americans in San Francisco. And you know, I know uh, you all have been engaged in some really uh, important efforts, and I want to uh, be able to bring all that out and let you all talk about uh, what you've been uh, excited about, whether that's been around uh, criminal justice reform or building the capacity of Black-led organizations or, you know, working to revitalize public housing without displacement or supporting Black businesses. So I'm looking to get in uh, to all of that. But uh, before going there, I wanted to just kind of ask a general question. I mean, the, uh, the last year has been one where uh, the divisions and disparities across racial lines have been uh, really clear. Uh, some just amazing uh, political wins came out uh, in November. Uh, we've got Vice President Harris. Uh, we've got uh, Senator Warnock. Uh, we saw just amazing leadership from uh, black mayors, black council members, black supervisors, black district attorneys this summer uh, in response to like the, the calls for justice. So can you just talk first about just generally, what's it like to be a, a black elected leader in this moment? I would say, you know, two words in terms of just challenging and opportunity. 
obviously challenging because of the COVID-19 pandemic. We still have uh, black people being killed disproportionately by law enforcement across the country and so many continued inequities that exist. But then you know, also, if you look at the spectrum of black leadership, to your point, both nationally and, and definitely here locally, it's an exciting time for us as, as black leaders. Uh, I'm excited, of course, to be here with the first black woman mayor here in San Francisco, uh, sitting here looking at the CEO of the San Francisco Foundation, who is a black man. So there's been a lot of strides that we definitely have the opportunity to take in, in terms of leadership. But we also understand the challenges. And, and I just want to say that I think this is a great time to be a black leader here in San Francisco and in, in the country, because I think finally more folks are starting to realize all the injustices that have affected our community, all the inequities, and that we are owed more than we've been given. And whether it's social media, whether it's because things are being captured differently and folks are starting to understand that we didn't just make up all these inequities, I think this is a good place and good time to be in leadership and actually be bold about the things that we get to do. Well, I, I would certainly agree with President Walton. I mean, it is, of course, um, a challenging time, but it's a very exciting time. And you, we all know the history of redevelopment, even in San Francisco, and how the displacement of a large part of the African-American community played into the adjust injustices that still persist today. When you look at the census since 1970, you've seen a decline, a significant decline of the African-American population in the city while other populations have grown. The reason why CEQA and all the abilities that people have now to protest and to have open forums and public comment and a number of other things had a lot to do with what happened to black people in the Western edition community and their fight for a seat at the table in the decisions that are being made. And meanwhile, you had incredible leaders like Mary Helen Rogers, Eloise Rook Westbrook, Calvin Jones, Nate Mason, Alex Pitcher, all these incredible African-Americans and members of the Board of Supervisors, Ella Hill Hutch and, and others who were fighting against the injustices for a seat at the table and when they asked for a seat at the table, it just wasn't for African-Americans. We paved the way for so many other minorities to have these same opportunities. And the problem here is you disproportionately see how African-Americans have not benefited from that advocacy. And that's why we can no longer be content with making decisions and, and, and across a whole spectrum. I do think it's important that we look at the inequities in any situation and make investments in a community based on what those inequities are. For example, we have less than 6% population African-Americans, but almost 40% of the homeless population are African-Americans. But when I visit these sites that we open up for affordable housing, when I visit these sites that we open up, um, I hardly see any African-Americans. And, and, and the response is, well, you know, we have, you know, 8%, we have over 10% uh, African-Americans. I'm like, well, wait a minute. We don't need to look at proportional to the population. We need to look at proportional to the homeless population and address that inequity. And so, yes, it's an amazing time. And it's so important, regardless of whether or not we're black, I don't care who you are in leadership. These are the kinds of inequities that you have a responsibility to not only call out, but to make investments and in policy changes that will lead to a difference in what we're seeing. So I believe that the work that President Walton and I have been doing together will really lead to that kind of change, which is why it is so exciting to be in a leadership position right now in San Francisco. All right, thank you both for indulging me with that opening question. Now to talk about uh, San Francisco, you know, I laid out a, a laundry list of things that you all are doing to be responsive to the uh, needs of the African American community in San Francisco. And that list, I'm sure, leaves off a lot of stuff uh, for both of you all. What are you excited about right now in terms of the things that you're working on uh, as it relates to the African American community in San Francisco? Well, I, I guess I'll start again. It is Women's History Month, uh, Mayor Breed, but uh, I, you didn't jump in, so I, I'll start. I, I would say, you know, 
obviously we are extremely excited about the Dream Keeper Initiative and the $120 million that has been redirected from the police department, sheriff's department that is going to invest in the black community. The, the biggest thing for me why I'm so excited about that, number one, is not just the fact that we have resources going towards home ownership, towards city employment, towards workforce training and development, towards capacity building for, for black organizations, towards the arts uh, organizations in the black community, but because this was really developed and all the conversations and forums were with black people. So black people led this conversation, black people participated in this conversation. And by the way, I, I do have to say thank you so much to Director Cheryl Davis and her team at the Human Rights Commission for facilitating all these community conversations and these forums. But everything identified in terms of the areas in, of injustices that needed resources dedicated was identified by black people and conversations with black people. And I have so much respect for our allies, but it is important that people understand and know that we can make decisions for ourselves, that we understand what our, our issues and our concerns are, and that we have the ability to say, this is how we need to address the injustices that have continued to exist. As Mayor Breed talked about all of the disproportionate negative outcomes for a very small population, we have to do the things that are gonna work for us as a community. So I'm extremely excited about that. And I'm also excited about these resources because I truly feel that it is our first step towards true reparations for the black community. We can talk about the inequities and injustices that exist, but we also have to put resources where our mouths are. And this is something that we are doing with, the, with that redirection. And so we actually have a reparations plan on the books. Uh, we legislated a reparations working group my office took the lead, supported unanimously by the Board of Supervisors, of course, by our mayor and a lot of folks in this community. And so having a working group that is legislated, that is going to be charged with looking at all the injustices in the black community and coming up with a reparations plan, a reparations package and the resources that are going to drive that plan is important. And when I'm not here anymore, when Mayor Breed is not here anymore, this has been legislated, it's on the books. And so this first 120 million, 60 million, and this fiscal year is really that first true step towards reparations while we work through the plan with the working group. This couldn't be more timely. And, and I'm excited about what this is gonna do to overturn a lot of these negative outcomes that has affected our community. Well, I, I got to say, um, along with uh, President Walton, I'm definitely excited about the Dream Keepers Initiative um, because we have had conversations in the past in this city about so many things related to the African-American community. Fred, you remember when I led one of those conversations at the African-American Art and Culture Complex, yes. there were constantly these things and these documents and all these things created. But as soon as you said... African-American money, African-American housing, African-American this, African-American that. All of a sudden, it's like, well, we can't really do things like that. And what I was always frustrated by is, well, we know what the problem is, especially, and I go back to the Western edition. We were asked by the redevelopment agency to support affordable housing, to support more housing. The community supported that, but then when you built 60 units, all of a sudden, hardly any African-Americans were living there. In the public housing that I grew up in, over 300 units torn down, 200 built, and hardly anyone that I grew up was able to move back. And so what we are finally starting to do is have honest conversations, as I said, about what we need to do. And we're saying to, of course, allies, thank you for supporting black people, but we don't need you to tell us what we need. When you look at all these nonprofit agencies in San Francisco, many of them are run by white people. Many of them have a lot of white staff. And yes, they, they have compassion and they care and they support the community. But a lot of times I feel like organizations and even political leadership and other leadership in the city, they don't trust African-Americans to lead these organizations, to, to make hard decisions for ourselves. There was just an article in the Chronicle talking about how little grant money African-American nonprofits receive to do the work in African-American communities. And so 
What I'm excited about is we're calling things out and we're asking people to support, but also trust that we know what to do when it comes to our community, number one. And so our community put together this plan and it's not just about giving money to organizations. It's about down payment assistance. It's about universal income because of the inequities. People always wonder, well, you know, if you give someone a job or if you help them financially some way, then most likely they're not gonna be out there doing some of the things they're doing. That was a barrier to unemployment, a barrier to employment opportunities and a barrier to having the skill set necessary to thrive in this city was really what I think created uh, the environment that I grew up in, a lack of opportunity. And that's why we have to break those barriers. We have to make sure that money is not an obstacle to success. And that involves looking at universal income seriously. It involves investing in our kids now. It involves making changes and not just continuing to do the same thing and expect a different result. I'm excited that people are calling me and I'm calling them and they're saying, I wanna invest in black people like we just did with the grant money we got for black businesses. So I'm excited that people are finally understanding that there is a real challenge here. And if we don't turn things around for black people in San Francisco, how do we continue to talk about San Francisco as this thriving beacon of hope for so many people who come here from all over and this diverse, incredible city. And at the same time, we're like, oh, well, that's, that's, that's the black community. That is what it is. No, we can't do that. And now we're not, we're investing money. We're changing policy. We're calling it out and we're not messing around and we're doing it with the black community. So I think that is really exciting. It's the first time I've ever seen anything like this. And I'm so glad to be mayor leading this effort. Thank you both. It's so great to see both of you all so excited about the, uh, the new efforts that are uh, happening. I want to stick with you for a second, uh, Mayor Breek, before Shaman jumps in this time. Um, you talked a lot about housing uh, and a number of occasions and homelessness. And we know uh, that African-Americans are uh, several times more likely to be evicted and displaced. We, you talked about the disparities in terms of homelessness. What are the things that you're planning uh, to do and are already doing in order to kind of keep black families housed in San Francisco? I have a lot that I'm doing. I'll start with accountability. You know, every single year we provide rental assistance for those who are facing eviction to prevent eviction in the first place. Do you know how many black people I've sent to these nonprofit agencies and the money is already gone? So right now we're doing audits and reports because I want to understand, well, why is the money always gone? And why aren't African-Americans being served by these resources? Because that is part of the problem. We expect to get almost $100 million in stimulus money from the federal government and money from the state to help with rental assistance. So there should be no excuse when it comes to serving and helping African-American families during this pandemic. And I am very actively engaged in the nitty gritty of how this money is getting distributed and making sure that the organizations responsible for supporting communities are outreaching to African-American communities, are making sure they know they exist because that is a big problem in this city. And that is one that I plan to address. The other thing that you know that I did before I was mayor was neighborhood preference. Uh, when we look at all of the housing that's being built in San Francisco, especially in uh, neighborhoods like District 6, where we have a large population of homeless African-Americans, the Bayview Hunters Point community, again, making sure that the people who live in those communities have right of first refusal when it comes to access to those housing, number one. Number two, making sure that we invest the dollars for outreach necessary to go and get those applications. We did this with the first place that we were able to use neighborhood preference at uh, Willie B. Kennedy Apartments. We have about 98 units at Willie B. And we invested $150,000. And there were over close to about nine, almost 10,000 applications. And even with that money, Guess how many African-American applications we had? Less than 600. 
But at the same time, because of neighborhood preference, we were able out of those 98 units to get almost 29 African-Americans from the neighborhood in Willie B. And typically, Fred, you know this, we would probably be lucky to get one, two or three. So implementing that, investing in the outreach efforts, helping with now payment assistance, building more housing now, removing the barriers, making sure that there's a connection between the people who live here, especially in those neighborhoods, making sure there's a real connection between their children and access to the housing that we built in the neighborhood. Because I, I, I know a lot of friends whose kids are still living at home because they can't afford to do anything else. They're working. They're working at maybe, you know, Starbucks or, or Jamba Juice trying to go to school at City College and can't afford anything else. We have to change what success looks like for Black people in San Francisco. Housing, economic stability, economic equity in this city. I mean, African Americans make about 31,000 a year compared to whites, who are over 120, 30,000 a year. So, looking at all of those things and creating a pipeline, housing is at the forefront of that. Your housing security is everything when it comes to your ability to take care of yourself and your family. And I think that has played a role in the destruction of black people in San Francisco. And so we got to get back to our investments. And I'm glad the Dream Keepers Initiative addresses some of that. Thank you. Um, Supervisor, I would would love to hear if you want got anything to add here around housing. I've got another question for you as well, though. Definitely want to just add, you know, for for me, it's really about being aggressive with policies that are going to benefit the black community. So one, if you talk about neighborhood preference like Mayor Breed and Supervisor Cohen worked on before she became mayor, making sure that we are utilizing those policies to the benefit of our communities. Uh, When I was at Young Community Developers, we developed our first all affordable housing project, 60 units. Uh, We were able to use certificate of preference and bring back 12 families that were living in other Bay Area counties that came back to San Francisco through certificate of preference. So I'm working right now with OCI and the state to increase the opportunity for a certificate of preference to extend to more members of the family, uh, also to even extend to commercial properties so that we don't lose our black businesses uh, that have been a part of our community and the fabric of our community for a very long time. Every housing project that comes to, to District 10 and folks wanna develop, we push for a minimum of 50% affordable housing. We were able to push, for example, if you look at the Petrel Yard modernization uh, project that MTA is working on for their new facility and they wanna build housing on top. We were able to get the language in the RFQ to say at least 50% and up to 100% affordable housing. We have to be very aggressive in our policies that are gonna make sure that we allow black folks to live in places that they can afford and that is going to be, of course, um, acceptable to, to, to their needs and, and community. So it's the policies that we make, it's the level of affordability that we push for. It's also, of course, the jobs and careers and the resources that are provided in that manner. And then eviction protections is, is major. We are obviously through this pandemic, pushing very hard to keep folks from being evicted and continuously pushing policies that extend eviction protections. And we've been able to do it faster and more rapid during the pandemic. So we can do some things that are gonna be similar to keep folks from being evicted as we move forward, even when we come out of the pandemic. But I think the biggest thing is we look at our Hope SF communities. And we have right now, and we learned a lot from the mistakes that were made in the past in the Western edition in terms of building and people still being able to stay on site, not having to be relocated to the magnitude to where we typically just disintegrate the entire community. And the Hope SF is doing that. We're actually building brand new revitalized units and former dilapidated public housing communities while people still live on site. And obviously that's not the answer to everything. This is housing for for folks who've always been in low income communities and we need to do a lot more, but we did learn some lessons and we are doing some things that are gonna provide a new opportunity for our folks to still live in their communities. And we gotta make sure that not only are we doing affordable housing, not only are we revamping 
our public housing community, but the economic opportunities and resources come with the building of that housing as well. Yeah, and it's an honor for us to be in partnership with both of you all on Hope SF. Um, Supervisor, let me ask you another question. Um, you know, you spoke about uh, when you were describing the many things that you're both working on, uh, reparations. Uh, and I think for a lot of people, it's been uh, inspiring and eyebrow raising uh, to hear you kind of speak unapologetically about the call and the need for us to have a reparations frame uh, as we think about the work in relationship to the African-American community. Why has been using that word and that phraseology been so important to you? Well, I, I, you know, one, I think it's important to say that I obviously did not start the reparations conversation. In fact, this conversation has really been around for over a century. And uh, there are people who came before me uh, who, who started this conversation for a long time across the country. But I think it's important to start from folks understanding and realizing one, when you are taken from your homeland, brought to a place where you weren't allowed to receive an education, you weren't a allowed to reduce in the manner and the way that you, you should be, when you weren't given property, you weren't given an opportunity to earn an income, and you basically built a country, 100 years of free labor, and you weren't given a cent for, for that work. So we had no opportunity at True Wealth as Black people here in this country. And that needs to be stated and understood. And yes, we are owed reparations here in this country. Fast forward to even here in San Francisco, when we look at redlining, when we look at how our, our families and communities have been pushed out, gentrification and what happened with redevelopment, particularly in areas like the Western Edition, we need to understand that that basis and that cry and that fight and that that asking and demanding for reparations is something that is 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 owed to us as a black community. So I just wanted to start there. And reparations is really about repairing the damage and giving people what they are owed. We have seen reparations happen for our Native American community. We have seen reparations happen for our Japanese community. And of course, we now need to see reparations happen for us as black people, and we have to be unapologetic. We also have to understand what we're talking about when we talk about reparations. A lot of folks talk about just giving people a check. And a lot of folks talk about, you know, let's just spread money out, look at how many black people we have in this country, and then give, give everybody a, a, a chunk of a one lump sum. And the reality of it is we're owed more than just uh, a lump sum of money. We're owed an opportunity to really overcome the negative outcomes that have happened in our communities for a long time. We're owed free education. We owe resources for home ownership. And yes, universal basic income should be a part of it. We should be giving folks a check that, you know, and, and be saying we apologize for making you work for us and build this country for over a hundred years, for hundreds of years. But we also need to make sure that we're addressing all those things that have led to negative outcomes for us over criminalization uh, or black businesses. All of these things need some type of support, need some type of resources for us to really achieve true equity, for us to really build wealth in our communities. And reparations is that way. Reparations is something that we've been talking about for a very long time. And now going back to your first question, we have an opportunity to have this bold leadership, to have bold policies that we're putting in place. We're gonna achieve reparations here in San Francisco, and we're gonna do it in a manner that's gonna build wealth and provide an opportunity for, for black people to thrive here in San Francisco. I wanna to shift to, to COVID and health, but before doing so, is there anything, uh, Mayor, you wanna to add to that? Well, I'll just say that um, this is a important and very timely conversation, especially um, in this moment in, in our country's history. Uh, what we saw last year, sadly, with the tragic murder of George Floyd uh, was an uprising against racial injustice like we've never experienced. Like, it, I, I, you know, Black people, this is what we live and sadly, we're used to it and we're used to being outraged and we're used to expressing ourselves and being very vocal. But for whatever reason, last year, took things to a whole nother level. And I felt like the entire world was with us in our pursuit 
for real change. And, and, and so when we talk about real change, uh, economic inequities that have existed are a part of that change. Uh, because when you look at even my upbringing and the people I grew up with who ended up dead in jail on drugs, we were poor. And so people did what they felt they had to do to get money. Just imagine if that was no longer a barrier, what could have happened to the lives of so many of those people. And that's what I think about. I am mayor. I am the exception. I'm not the norm. We can change that. We can change that by making the right investments and making the decisions. And, and, and really, instead of just saying that Black Lives Matter, demonstrating that Black Lives Matter, and that there is a need to repair the historic damage that has been done to a race of people in this country for generations. And so it is timely, it is important, and I'm looking forward to the outcome. And the work we're doing with the Dream Keeper Initiative is just the start. Thank you. Um, I mean, one of the things that's happened with COVID-19 is just brought the very high relief, the inequities in our health systems in terms of access to quality care in terms of underlying conditions and disparities uh, across all racial groups, frankly, not even just uh, the African-American community. Can you all talk a little bit about how COVID-19 and its uh, disproportionate impacts on communities of color is kind of shaping your thoughts about and leadership around health issues? Yeah, I, I'll jump in. I, I, the first thing I want to say, and you know, this is true for so many different uh, negative health impacts. They affect our community, the Black community, disproportionately than other communities. So even if we look at COVID-19 pandemic in terms of the number of folks who were contracting the virus, we had higher numbers, particularly in District 10, and two four zip codes, uh, three four zip codes, and. 07, the Latino community was definitely affected disproportionately. And so we knew from the from onset that we need to get ahead of even this pandemic and make sure that we had the appropriate testing in our communities, make sure that contact tracing was happening and making sure that we had spaces for people to know and understand if they were contracting the virus so they could keep their family safe all over community, right? So that was our first big push. We need testing, testing, testing all throughout the community. And we learned some lessons from what happened with testing to where now when we have the vaccine, we actually make, made sure that vaccines were in our isolated and disenfranchised communities early on so that we could take care of the folks who were disproportionately affected by the, the virus. But I would just say, well, we've known in the black community for a very long time that negative health outcomes affect us typically more whether we look at diabetes, we look at asthma, and we look at some of the things that are in our air that lead to some of these negative health outcomes. So yes, the pandemic has made me want to provide more information to our community, make sure that we are bringing our community together to learn about not only COVID-19, but about really all the negative health out outcomes for, for Black folks, and make sure that we are bringing in the right professionals to have these conversations. We gotta kill a lot of myths. COVID-19 has really taught me that we have a lot of myths in our community, a lot of people listening to folks that uh, don't understand medically what, what is really happening. So we have to make sure that folks understand that things are safe and for us to protect our families and our communities, we have to listen to medical professionals. Testing is safe, the vaccine is safe. And of course, we have to make sure that these things are communicated from and by medical professionals so that our folks would trust that. We know about all of the, the ways they've experimented with us as, as a people. And so that's why that distrust is here and it is valid. And we are not gonna get to a point where we understand certain ways to take care of ourselves because we have to, we have to first get over those myths and, 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 and really accept um, how we can be better uh, in, in, in terms of our, our health. And so for me, it's really about information, 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 and allowing for those spaces and places for our community to come together and learn about, you know, not, not just the pandemic itself, but about all the negative health disparities that exist because there are so many 
uh, that affect us disproportionately as a people. And, that, and that's not new. It didn't just start with the COVID-19 pandemic and information is key so we can keep our folks safe. Thank you, Mayor. But, well, when this pandemic, uh, when we first knew that it was going to hit and we didn't completely understand it, we did understand at least one thing that certain communities would be disproportionately impacted because of uh, the issues around trust and also information. So from day one in our emergency response team that we set up, our COVID command center, we embedded an equity team, an equity team that could reach out to those communities, communities that are in far reaches of San Francisco, especially in the OMI and the Bayview Hunters Point and, and the west side of the city, like places that usually are not um, comfortable with what's happening around city government and especially something like a, a, a global pandemic that even many of us were trying to wrap our, our hands around. And part of that was making sure that we were communicating, that we were um, educating the community about what we knew, even if we didn't know everything. And that we were trying to build trust so that testing and resources and support um, were able to flow through those communities um, as a result of the work that we did. And in particular, when this um, vaccine first uh, became possible, the first thing I said to my COVID command team that we are gonna do, because I know my people, we're gonna set up in the Bayview, we're gonna set up in the Western Edition, we're gonna set up in Chinatown, we're gonna set up in the Mission. These are the communities that are most disproportionately impacted. And guess what? They don't have to make appointments. They just have to live in certain zip code and meet the qualifications. So they just show up. And then separately from that showing up, we went to community stakeholders who work with seniors, who work with senior centers and other places that are right across the street from these locations. And they are spending not just one day in advance, they spent several months in advance to get people ready for what was coming in terms of the vaccine. So that's why now in San Francisco, you, we have over 64% of those who are over the age of 65 that have been vaccinated and over 22% of San Franciscans over the age of 16 have been vaccinated. Uh, and a lot of that is not just our appointment system because you know that exists as well, but it's the work that we've done in those communities that have been disproportionately impacted. When we look at what's happening with our children, we all know before this pandemic, way before this pandemic, the inequities continued. And we're talking about a small population of black students in our public school systems, but they represent the highest rates of not only suspensions, but dropouts. So we are failing black kids in our school system. And now as a result of this pandemic and the fact that us as grownups can't get our stuff together to get our children, I don't care what race they are, but our children back in school based on science, based on data that we've been following in San Francisco from some of the most conservative public health experts anywhere in the world, it's criminal. It's criminal. And what we're going to see is that wide divide, that, that, that inequity gap continue. We went early on with our equity team. We put Wi-Fi in those hotspots, in those areas where kids most likely did not have access to the internet. We handed out devices, uh, computers. We set up learning hubs and have served over 2000 students, a lot from public housing. We did everything we could as a city, but when we look at the data and those who had no services, no support from the city whatsoever, as it relates to devices or any type of help, they go like this in terms of their grades and learning. The other kids are going like this. So we're seeing that divide get wider and it's getting worse for kids that are kids that are African-Americans. And so it is really devastating 
Um, and it is why I have been working so hard and doing everything I can to support the school district to get our schools open. We've given them $15 million, additional resources, ballot measures, the whole Department of Public Health at their disposal whenever to evaluate schools. And we've already cleared six that they allowed us to go into. It is really, really hurting black kids in this city. And we have to do better. We have to do better. Thank you both for your leadership on this important uh, issue. My um, Zoom DM is blowing up, y'all. So let me um, uh, get to some questions. Um, one is, there's one question here about the fact that so many African-Americans have already left San Francisco. Is there anything that we can do to encourage folks to return? Well, one, I think there are things we are doing to encourage uh, folks to return as we talk about, again, certificate of preferences, uh, being able, we bought families back in the first uh, affordable housing project I had an opportunity to, to serve on. Um, and then we talk about, we also, the mayor and I increase uh, the preference for our HOPE SF projects. And so uh, individuals who have lived in any HOPE SF public housing community has the ability to come back after we do the replacement for folks that currently live on site. So there are policies that we're working on. Obviously we're working on more affordable housing, more job opportunities, uh, improving our, our, our school system. And to Mayor Breed's point, we're gonna have to do what we can as a city to provide resources and support accelerated learning opportunities for our folks who are, are, are missing out and the, that are suffering from the increase in the achievement gap. So those are the thing, things we're gonna have to focus on too. But yes, there are things are in place to, to try to bring people back. But I'm also very clear about the fact that I want to make sure that our folks who live in San Francisco that look like me and you have the opportunity to be successful and succeed as well. I can't ignore the fact that even though we're less than, than 5% of the population, that the folks who live here need us and I'm gonna work hard for them while we still work on opportunities for, for people to come back. Well, I, I would just add to that, um, that it is important for sure that for the African-Americans that we have in the city, that we are making sure that they survive and thrive. And so what's been important to me is working with a number of companies here in San Francisco, tech companies and uh, companies that are traditional companies that have been here for a long time and making sure that they feel that they have a responsibility to help and to support and to uplift the next generation. Our program, our uh, opportunities for all program, it, we provide paid internships to all high school students. And a lot of companies have partnered with us because what I want, I mean, what happened to me, I didn't know all this stuff existed in San Francisco growing up. I didn't know what was going on in downtown. I just know that's where all the money was made. I didn't understand the connection between, you know, poverty and what happens. I, I learned that over time. I didn't even know what college really was until I was in the 10th grade. So there were a lot of things that I was disconnected from. My goal is to work with, you know, companies, to work with schools, to work with various industries and to make a real connection between young people and people in communities that have been neglected and access to those opportunities. That is so important. The other thing that I'm really focused on is making sure that those companies um, have equity officers, that they are connecting um, with historically black colleges and, and places where they will recruit and retain African-American engineers and other folks in the fields that they need. Um, the other thing within the Dream uh, Keeper initiative is resources to provide a pipeline for city employment for African-Americans. So we're looking at ways to look at employment opportunities um, so that people can thrive economically. And will that lead to them living in San Francisco? I don't know, um, because we know how expensive it is to live here. Uh, and it's also, I know, very hard to start a family in San Francisco. And so it's, it, it definitely will be tough, but I, I think some of the things we're gonna do will hopefully at least stabilize the existing population that we have. Thank you. Second question here, what uh, steps are necessary to be taken and are being taken to uh, support and be responsive to the African-American LGBTQ community? 
Well, one of the things that I'm really proud of, too, about the Dreamkeeper Initiative is the commitment to the LGBT community. Um, in fact, some of the work that I did early on as mayor um, specifically related to our uh, Black trans community, because disproportionately, when you look at um, those uh, in the LGBT, LGBT community who have been killed um, due to violence, it's mostly Black trans uh, women uh, who have been targets, and also the unemployment rate and a number of other disparities exist specifically um, with oftentimes Black trans women. And part of what we've done with some of the resources, not just in the Dreamkeeper Initiative, but investment in housing, investment in employment, um, and also making sure that it's not an either or. You know, if you're African American, no matter who you choose to identify as, you are a part of the collective of the work that we do here in San Francisco as it relates to supporting and uplifting the African American community. And I'm proud of Trans Home SF in particular because that is um, an initiative that uh, we started here in San Francisco um, to specifically help around housing and, and uh, access to housing in San Francisco. Um, we still have a long ways to go, a lot of work to do, but um, we want to make sure that folks know that um, this is also an important part of our initiative and what we need to do in San Francisco. I don't have much to add to that, but the, but I do want to make sure that uh, everyone knows to, to Mayor Breed's point and to the way we approached not only the Dream Keeper initiative, but everything we do is to make sure that we have resources specific to the LGBTQ community, make sure that leaders from the LGBTQ community, Black leaders from the LGBTQ community participated. Because again, when we're talking about prioritizing resources for the Black community, we're talking about the entire Black community, no matter how you identify. And even early on, after the, the, the murders of Breonna Taylor, the murders of George Floyd at the hands of law enforcement, when we did rallies and when we did, um, when we did marches, we, we did a couple of them with the LGBT, Black LGBT community and made sure that everyone understood that this fight is for all Black people and that, and that work is gonna continue in that manner. So when we're talking about Black lives, we're talking about everybody. Yeah. And you both at various points have referred to the uh, this summer's events and the, uh, the calls for reform. Uh, what's happening in San Francisco to transform policing? Well, there's a lot that's happening um, in San Francisco. And, and, and let's just be clear, um, this, is, this is not going to change overnight. Um, people want instant change, and I want instant change. But this work around reform in the San Francisco Police Department in particular, it, did, it didn't just start when I became the mayor. It started when I was on the Board of Supervisors, working with Malia Cohen on the Board of Supervisors calling for a push to reform and specifically the recommendations from at the time when President Obama was president, he put forth 272 recommendations out of the Department of Justice that address issues around bias and use of force and a number of other things that if put into place could be helpful, not solve the issues, but could be helpful because at the same time, we can put in all the policies we want in the world around and, and make those changes. And we've seen the benefits here in San Francisco. We've seen, you know, the use of force cases decline. We've seen a number of other changes in terms of the data in San Francisco, not where it needs to be, but at least much better than it has been in the past. We can use all of that and do all this scientific data stuff that we're doing. But at the end of the day, what we have to root out of our police department are people who are racist, are people who are sexist, are people who are anti-Semitic, are people who have a problem with our LGBT uh, Q brothers and sisters, are people who have those kinds of things where they feel a certain way about a particular population of people because of who they identify, who they love, or what their race is. Um, and, and, and so that's a part of the work because you know, it's also wanting our police officers to just decide why they want to be a police officer and can they genuinely serve and protect every citizen equally, whether they look like them or not. 
Um, so we got to get to the heart of that as it relates to policing. But yes, the other part of that is changes to policies. It's uh, addressing uh, the biases that exist, exist, the accountability component, the diverting of resources, um, and, and, and just a full you, you know, accountability component and making sure people know that there are consequences for making bad decisions that sadly can result in harming another human being. You know, so there's a balance here. Do I want police officers in my community? Yes. Do I want them to respect me? Yes. Do I want them to come when, when I'm in trouble? Yes. Do I want them to harm someone in my community who's not doing anything to anyone? Heck no. So there's a balance here. And we've seen in so many instances where, you know, cases involving black people, you just change the color of that person and it wouldn't have been handled in the same way. We have got to get past that. We have got to get past that. And that is what I'm committed to. And we're making uh, uh, progress. We're not where we want to be, but we're going to continue to work on it to get where we need to be. And some of the immediate policy changes we worked on here as uh, soon as um, that happened. And by the way, again, we, we're not doing this work just because of what happened this past summer. This is These things have existed uh, for far too long in the Black community. Uh, but the district attorney and I worked on a resolution to say to SFPD and the Sheriff's Department, we will no longer hire anyone from another jurisdiction that has a history of misconduct, a history of racial profiling, here in San Francisco's uh, law enforcement bodies. And so we're working with the Civil Service Commission on that to make sure that that never happens again. You know about the reinvestment of resources from law enforcement to go on the front end to support community, to give them the things that they need so that people can make wise decisions and have the resources and opportunities that they need. Uh, not Also, not just to pick on the police department because we have our issues in our sheriff's department as well. We pushed our office led a charter amendment, Prop D, to make sure that we now have a sheriff's oversight board in place and there will be an office of inspector general that will investigate misconduct and certain allegations from the sheriff's department. And so that we don't have basically, you know, the 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 Fox Garden hen house. And we have a situation where there are independent investigations conducted to check law enforcement and make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do. There's also the things that we're working on from a policy standpoint to, to do everything we can to avoid negative interaction between the black community, communities of color and police. So we have our caution against racially exploitative non-emergencies act, um, which is also known as the Karen Act, where we have penalties in place for people who wanna call 911 or call law enforcement on a person just because they're black, just because of their gender, just because of any protected class. It's important that we do the things we can to avoid that negative law enforcement contact. And there are people out there who weaponize the police department against people of color, and they know that it results to negative interaction, and in some cases, death for black people. We can go back to Emmett Till, who have, of course, it was a misallegation made about some of the things he did, and that 14-year-old boy was killed in the early 50s in Mississippi. And so we can't let things like that happen. And we have to do everything we can to also avoid any type of negative interaction and then prioritizing training and what that looks like. Uh, you heard Mayor Breed talk about making sure that we don't have folks in our police force who are racist, anti-Semitic, you know, who are homophobic. And the training has to reflect that. And we have to call it out. We have to have anti-racist training in our police academies and, and, and get people to understand that no matter what someone looks like, no matter the community or the area that they live in, they need to be treated with respect and dignity because police officers have to show up in a way that they're part of community, a part of the fabric of, of our communities. And that has been done before and we need to make sure that that happens here in San Francisco and our communities. Yeah. And so I just too. want to add Fred, to that because um, yeah. President Walton brought up a good point about alternatives to policing for responding to certain calls in the community. Mm -hmm. And so we uh, created um, a team of, of folks, the street uh, violence response or rapid response. I forget the name of it anyway. Um, it's the it's the uh, the fire department, uh, paramedic, 
a clinician uh, and also a community peer person. So when you see someone having a mental health episode and you call 911, uh, this particular unit responds to those calls instead of law enforcement, especially if it's not violence. It's just, you know, someone might be, you know, doing something to potentially create a problem for themselves, but maybe not a problem for other people. And so using professionals who understand how to address mental illness, uh, these teams are responding to that, de-escalating the situation. In some cases, they're able to provide on-site uh, support in various ways that law enforcement can't. Uh, and so far, they've been doing an incredible job and have been responding to a lot of the 911 calls for those who are struggling with mental illness. So looking at alternatives to policing um, so that we can de-escalate a situation that could have the potential of getting out of control and force could be used. Yeah, you two have covered a lot of ground. We've talked about housing, jobs, health, education, law enforcement. These are all very local, uh, localized issues to be sure, uh, but they are also issues that don't necessarily conform neatly to jurisdictional boundaries. Uh, can you two talk a little bit about uh, how you think about the region uh, in relationship to uh, being responsive to the black community? Well, I, um, I, I think about a lot of the work that I do, uh, not just on a regional level, but on a you know, statewide and national level as it relates to the black community has been pretty incredible. Um, there are amazing resources of black mayors all over the country. Uh, we communicate and engage with one another on so many issues, uh, whether it's something happened in New Orleans, Atlanta, Chicago, um, it, it, we don't think of it in, in that way of addressing issues around race, but we do end up talking and, and trying to uh, engage with one another around issues to support and uplift African-American communities. And um, it's been like the whole conversation around what San Francisco is doing to divert the $121 uh, $120 million from law enforcement to um, uh, the African-American community, like the mayors are like, how did you do it? What are you doing? How are we? It, it just became a whole series of conversations. And so I think the, the relationships that exist with especially black elected leaders all over the country in Southern California, um, across the, across the state, um, those relationships have been invaluable. Um, I've been a part of a number of forums. We've shared and exchanged information around policies and things that we're doing in our communities, statistics and impacts. And, and, and so from my perspective, I don't just see it as a, a regional level. I see it as a national um, level because I think that when you look at other places, regardless of their African-American population in this country, you still see very similar disparities. The one thing that San Francisco was a little bit different in, in terms of our infection rate of African-Americans. It was very high in other places um, throughout the country, but here in San Francisco, it was more proportional to the population. Um, and, and so we were fortunate in that regard. And I think that our early work around equity played a role in helping us address those particular issues. So um, it, it has just been fascinating. It's been great. Um, but but the biggest issue that I think we all continue to struggle with and we need a, a somewhat of a national approach. And I think that um, uh, really addressing issues around redlining and home ownership um, when uh, Bloomberg was running for president, he outlined an entire plan around home ownership for African-Americans in this country. And I do think that we as mayors um, throughout the, the entire country, we're going to rally together and advocate and push for um, a change from the federal government to start to invest and deliberately support home ownership in the African-American community. And here in San Francisco with the Dream Keeper initiative, we're, we're starting, we're putting our money where our mouth is with down payment assistance uh, for African-Americans in San Francisco. So I I'm excited about what the future holds and, and I'm grateful for my partnerships with people all over the country. And, and I, I would just add, uh, you know, obviously, as the president of the Board of Supervisors here in San Francisco, my policy focus is very hyper local. Um, but, you know, Fred, you and I are both in black fraternities. 
Um, you know, we, we both went to historically black colleges and universities. And so the conversations I'm having regionally and quite frankly, nationally are through these bodies of organizations that are by black people, of black people and for black people. Right. So we have to continue to to lead on these issues through our fraternities. We have to continue to lead through our uh, for our people, through sororities, through the NAACP, through Black Chamber of Commerce, all across the region, across the state, across the country. And we're having these conversations and forums consistently. And, and in fact, these platforms have been provided by a lot of these organizations. I know Mayor Reed has participated in forums called by some of these folks, as well as myself and, and you and other Black leaders. The conversation has to continue through these Black organizations and, and these forums have to be able to continue to be set up because our people listen to, to folks in, in these organizations that are part of these organizations. And more importantly, our policymakers, including myself, including the mayor, listen to these entities as well. And I just have to throw another plug, plug for historically black colleges and universities. I think now is the time where we really need to get our folks to understand that these institutions that were set up to provide an education for us at a time where we could not receive an education at traditional schools here in this country. We need to take advantage of that and jump on that and, and understand the importance of those places and how significant they are for, for black people. And we're gonna to continue to promote our schools. We're gonna to continue to promote our organizations and, and, promote, and promote these regional and national conversations uh, through these bodies and these entities. Uh, thank you for lifting up the HBCUs. Um, you know, as I said at the top, uh, you two are, are the example of the right kind of leadership uh, uh, at the right moment. And I just want to uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Supervisor, for your leadership, the, the boldness with which you all are moving, and probably most importantly, uh, the example that you all are setting uh, for young, young African-American people uh, not only in San Francisco, but around the country to see uh, what's possible in terms of uh, where they can ascend to and the kind of impacts uh, they can have on their communities. Just thank you so much uh, for everything. Um, it's time for us to close. I uh, want to again thank the, the, the both of you. Uh, thank all the viewers. Uh, this program has been held in association with Inform at the Commonwealth Club. I'm Fred Blackwell, again, CEO of the San Francisco Foundation. And the program uh, is now adjourned. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Fred. Well done. See you later, Madam Mayor. Thank you.